So, we were looking at the uh, swinging of the arms and uh, how if you look at um, the swinging of the arms and the legs and you look at the total angular momentum of that about the center of mass here O is the center of mass in this case total equals this plus that of the legs. So, for it to cancel out okay, they have to be in opposite directions. So, the, the swinging has to happen in to avoid twisting of the trunk total H naught should be 0, which implies that the contributions of the arms and the legs have to cancel. Therefore, left arm must rotate in the same direction as the right leg. right leg and vice versa to cancel the contributions to be able to cancel the contributions. And then also because the legs I made a mistake here this should be mass of the leg and also because the legs have a higher mass and are longer. So, if L L is greater than L A and M L is greater than M A therefore, theta dot A should be greater than theta dot L, it has to rotate faster the arms in order to be able to cancel. And because they have to have the same time period, okay, because they have to be coordinated right, when you reach the maximum amplitude um, for the leg that should uh, correspond to the maximum amplitude of the arms. Therefore, theta a is now larger than theta l. So, that is why your arms swing more than your legs and they also need to the theta dot is also larger okay, in order to cancel out this total angular momentum. Also lower limbs Therefore, arms must rotate faster. Since the arms and legs must have the same time period of swing, to achieve the zero angular momentum. we increase the amplitude of swing of the arm. So, theta a as well as the rate of rotation.
Now let us look at, so we have looked at some of the um, dynamic analysis of whole body motions. Now we look at what is known in, biomecha in biomechanics especially as the inverse dynamics procedure. It is there even in robotics you would see inverse dynamics uh, appear often in any multi body dynamics. Uh, but in inverse dynamics in the case of biomechanics is basically to determine the forces and moments that you cannot measure directly, right. So, you want to find out uh, in this multi segmented system knowing some um, of the external forces and the body segment parameters to be able to determine the internal forces in the system, which is what we have. Now, we are doing it for a dynamic situation, we did that for the static situation and in the general inverse dynamics, we do not really use um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we look at joint moments rather than forces in individual muscles. Okay. We look at okay, at the knee joint, what is going to be the net moment that would have to be applied for a certain situation. So, inverse dynamics is used when you know kinematic data are known to compute the internal joint reactions and moments. Moments which are primarily due to the muscles. So, take this case of kicking a football. So, let us say at the instant just before striking the ball, you have omega equal to say 8 radians per second this direction and alpha 400 radians per second square. You have the mass of the lower and moment of inertia about the knee, the center of rotation at the knee is given as 0.35 kg meter square. The perpendicular distance from say this is the center of rotation, this is not a, um, so assume the knee is here, we are looking at the knee joint reactions k x and k y. This is the force from what? The the muscle which is the in this case it would be the quadriceps okay in the patellar tendon the force that is exerted by the quadriceps muscle and you have the distance from the knee to the center of mass of the leg is 22 centimeters and this moment arm here is 4 centimeters. Okay. So, you want to find out what is the force in the quadriceps muscle and the knee reactions just before the foot kicks the ball. Okay. This in this case omega and alpha we, we have done cases where earlier in the static situations we have looked at this. Here it always helps to draw the 
kinetic diagram. So, I have if this is my x y coordinate system, I have m a x and m a y acting at the center of mass and I have i alpha, i would be about this center of mass, th this is about c. What you are actually given is i about k, okay. so you have to be careful here you are given the moment of inertia about the knee joint. Okay. So, anyway you can do the you know it is straightforward I will let you do the calculations sigma f x equal to m a x sigma f y equal to m a y and sigma m m c if you take it will be this thing or if you take m k it will be you can do i c alpha plus r cross m a x okay, or m a x into that distance. So, let us just put this in the to make sure you get the right r would be distance of c from m a yes, but y is we are assuming it passes through the knee joint. So, it does not contribute to the moment, but yeah you can use um, to be more precise you can just use the full vector. So, when you solve these equations you get the f in the quadriceps muscle to be about 3500 newtons ok. In actuality do you think the force in the quadriceps would be more or less than this value? In all these cases we have used a single muscle right to find the contribution to the moment. Do you think this value is under predicted or over predicted? Think about how muscles act. Muscles act in typically in pairs, like about a joint. So, when you have the quadriceps exerting a force, you also have the hamstrings exerting a force. Okay. The hamstrings may be lengthening as they are exerting a force, but the force that is exerted by the hamstrings. So, this the actual so that is causing a say a clockwise moment this is causing a counterclockwise moment so for the net moment to be counterclockwise this actually has to be higher than what is predicted by this analysis so if you have a net joint moment counterclockwise so, we, we always talk about the net joint moment which means there is a clockwise moment and a counterclockwise <coughs> moment. The net moment is counterclockwise which implies that the muscle causing that net counterclockwise moment actually has to exert a higher force than what is predicted by this analysis. Okay. So, actual F quad is going to be <coughs> higher. because of the action of the antagonist muscles. So, that is something you should remember. Okay. Another example, in the case of a vertical jump you want to look at what is going to be the force exerted by the what tendon is this or what muscles would be acting here. This would be your calf muscles right? and this would be your Achilles tendon or calcaneal tendon. So, F in the 
calcaneal or Achilles tendon. The calcaneus is your heel bone which is where that tendon inserts. So, at the instant of vertical jumping what would be the tension in that tendon. So, you have the joint reaction here okay, J acting, you have the mass of the foot. If you look at the free body diagram of the foot, then you have the ground reaction force and let us say the mass of the person is 75 kgs and the vertical acceleration at the instant of push off is 12 meter per second square. This angle here is 30 degrees, the sole of the foot makes that angle. So, you can have a free body diagram like this, this is the and the length of the foot is say 27 centimeters, length of the toe region seven, moment arm of the Achilles tendon four centimeters and we know that <coughs> omega equal to minus 15 radians per second alpha equal to minus 150 radians per second square. So, the first thing you do is from the you are given the acceleration of the center of mass. Okay. In this case you are given some of the kinematics, but you do not know the ground reaction force. Okay. So, to determine the ground reaction force, okay, you have to use this information. You are given the vertical acceleration of the whole body center of mass. So, you say if this is F g the ground reaction force, then 2 F g. So, if I am looking at each foot right 2 F g minus m g in the vertical direction gives me m a in the vertical direction. A y is given as 12 meter per second square. If you look at the structure of the foot here, okay, this is the joint, the calcaneal tendon is acting at the on the heel bone. right? So, the joint reaction I am assuming acts somewhere in the this, this is the joint. So, these are the two the ankle joint is here. Okay. The calcaneal tendon is acting slightly away from that, okay. it is not passing through that joint. Okay. It is not a very accurate anatomical representation, but you get basically to give you the idea that the joint reaction force arises from the contact. So, here yeah the, the I would know from the anatomy from the anthropometric data those relative dimensions here it is a simplification I am saying this is what it is. I am just giving you the moment arm of the tendon about the joint anyway. So, so, if you have this then you get F g equal to 825 newtons on each foot. 
which is what I would then use here in the free body diagram of the foot. So, I look at the whole body find the ground reaction force then use that in the free body diagram of the foot to compute my unknowns which would be F calc and the two components of J. Okay. So, here the mass of the foot is 1.5 kg which is 15 Newtons and in this particular particular case you could perhaps you, you can actually compare do a dynamic analysis and a static analysis. Okay. So, dynamic analysis impl meaning you think you take the acceleration of the center of mass of the foot to be 0 you say that there is no huh? for, static. for static for static sorry for a yeah for a dynamic analysis you take the uh, omega and alpha. So, you draw the kinetic diagram, but you can do and compare with a static analysis. you may find that in this case because the ground reaction forces are much higher it may not be there may not be a significant change between the two types of analysis. But I will leave you to do that as homework. No, no, no. So, you do not neglect. So, you do for this part of the analysis alone. See, if this was um, a static analysis, then this F g would only it is like you are standing on tiptoe. Okay. The F g would just be half the body weight. Here it is 750, right? 750 divided by 2 which is only 375 that is not the case. So, you cannot neglect it for this part. So, you find the actual ground reaction force and then for this part alone because the mass of the foot itself is so small in comparison to the uh, ground reaction force you could do a static analysis for the foot. This is for the second portion alone for the using for the free uh, FBD of the foot. This part you have to do it is a significant uh, contribution. So, you are just simplifying one part of the analysis. Okay. So, the general procedure for an inverse dynamic analysis is this. you start from say the most distal segment the foot you may actually have multiple. So, you may have the ground reaction force acting on the foot you have say the weight of the foot you may have multiple muscles. You may have ligaments acting at various. So, you may have forces due to ligaments, you may have you have the joint reactions, let us call that F j. And then you may also have frictional forces at the joint interfaces. So, there are a whole bunch of forces that could be acting on this body. Is 
the joint friction. Fj is the joint reaction force and Fm are the muscle forces. GRF is the ground reaction forces. Now, this you say is equivalent to you have the weight external force, you have the ground reaction force okay. and then the net effect of all the other forces you say R, Rx, Ry and some moment. Okay, that the combination of all these forces. So, in your inverse dynamics, you reduce all those unknowns basically to these three unknowns in a planar case. Your two components of the joint reaction and a net moment at that joint. And then because the if you look at the body, it is a multi segmented body. So, this is for an individual body, then you sort of propagate this method upwards and you say ok. So, I have if I have say hip, knee, ankle to take the example of a lower limb. Okay. This is my foot. Okay. Each one of these, so this is my thigh, I have the center of mass of the thigh here and I have some mass, some moment of inertia, okay. body segment parameters that I have from anthropometric data. Similarly, for the shank, so this is the thigh, this is the shank and this is the foot. Here I have some mass of the shank, some moment of inertia about its center of mass. Similarly, for the foot M F comma I F. So, what I would do is, okay, I start from here and I say if this is my point A, I say this is acted on by some GRF. Okay. This may have some omega A, alpha A, actually I should call that omega F alpha F because the angular velocity and acceleration are for the rigid body in this case the foot. Then at the ankle I have A x A y as the reactions and an M A the net joint moment. So, I take this rigid body the foot I apply the equations and I have A x, A y and I can solve for m g, m f g. I apply the equations to that. Then I look at my next, I move up the chain and I have my shank. So, this is my A, this is my K, ankle and knee. So, for this one, so let, let me represent the unknowns here in red. Okay. So, these are the unknowns I solve for. 
a x a y and m a. Once I do it for this ok, now a x a y and m a are known ok. So, I go to this one, now I have a x opposite to what I had on the ankle Newton's third law. So, then I have a y ok and m a is now in this direction. These are now known. Then I have m s g ok. I may have some omega s alpha s for the shank the kinematics known kinematics. Then at the knee my unknowns become k x k y and m k. So, I use this free body diagram with the known kinematics to solve for k x k y and m k. Do the move higher up and then I have the thigh. So, if I look at the thigh, this is my knee, this is my hip. From the previous analysis, I now know k x k y and sorry m k should be m k. Mass m t g and the thigh has some omega thigh alpha thigh. And this gives rise to reactions, unknown reactions at the hip, which are Hx, Hy, and Mh. Okay, so this is the procedure you follow. So you go from, you go in this direction, solving for for the unknown joint reactions and joint moments along the segments of the body. So, you can do this. Um, so, this is the general inverse dynamics procedure. You, So, far we have sort of focused on just one that we looked at, but the inverse dynamics procedure and biomechanics kind of goes through this multi segmented. So, you have a model for the body, you decide how many segments you are going to have, you know the level of uh, complexity. So, for the foot, you know you could have a toe region and a foot re foot. So, then you would start off at the toe region, find the joint reactions and moments at that joint, at the uh, metatarsophalangeal joint ok and then go to the ankle and then go to the knee to the hip and so on ok. So, this is the direction of the analysis. So, starting from the lowest segment all the unknowns are calculated step by step. And for each segment, you apply sigma f x equal to m a x sigma f y 
equal to m a y and sigma m about the center of mass equal to i c o m theta double dot of that particular segment. Typically, you would calculate the GRF like we did in the previous case from the whole body. So, we knew the acceleration of the center of mass in that particular you, we, you knew how much the person was jumping. So, you estimated the acceleration of the center of mass and computed the GRF. In the lab, there are usually ways to measure the GRF using force plates. So, you do not you, you would just measure the GRF directly and then you would measure the kinematics of all these segments. You would know the inertial parameters, the body segment parameters from the data. So, the kinematics would give you omega f, f alpha f, omega s, alpha s all that and then you would have the GRF from the, so GRF from whole body analysis or force plate. force plate measurements then omegas alphas from some motion capture system. And then you would look at the you would measure the internal joint reactions and uh, So, this is the form of inverse dynamics analysis where you know you calculate not individual contributions, but the net moment because this is a statically determinate system ok. You do not you have as many unknowns as you have equations. So, you can do this if you go to most more complex models like if you include multiple like you know we saw that this is the result of many contributions ok. So, there are models there is um, a very active field called musculoskeletal modeling where they actually have models for each type of these forces. So, the muscle forces you remember we had the Hills muscle model that we looked at. So, they would have a contractile they would have properties that have been determined from say cadaver studies and based on that they would have created a mechanical model for a muscle and they would say that is the model. So, you, you also take into account the vis viscoelastic nature of the muscle and all that to estimate those forces and you would have multiple muscles and it may not be a simple algorithm like you know saying constant stress in the muscle meaning the mu force is proportional to cross sectional area. It may be something more it, uh, it may be based on say some weightage based on EMG data that they have gathered in the lab. Uh, it could be based on like an overall optimization. So, energy consumption is a very uh, typical uh, quantity objective function because as humans we tend to we try to do most of our activities using minimal energy. So, they would look at various uh, uh, the contributions they would try to estimate the contributions from the various muscles based on these other parameters using some kind of uh, minimization of some objective uh, function. So, obviously, those are computationally very intensive you have lots of variables lots of and there is no direct way of validating those models I know unless you actually go in an instrument you know you cut somebody up put in sensors that will measure the forces in each of their uh, um, uh, muscles and ligaments and all that. So, these are, but you try to look at validation on a um, you know you look at experimental data. So, EMG for instance is one way ok if you know that ok these are the muscles that are acting then you look at your model. So, you have different methods of validation of this, but there is no direct validation to say that ok this is exactly what this muscle force is going to be. In many cases this kind of a general uh, um, this kind of an inverse dynamic analysis procedure is still pretty useful to give you a good idea of 
what is happening inside the body. So, the next um, few classes we will again be looking at um, the biomechanics involved in certain whole body movements ok. Uh, similar to um, so, balance is something again very key to how we operate as um, to operate effectively ok, because as bipeds you know we are looking at if you look at our feet So, this is the area of our base of support ok. So, when you are standing as long as the line from the center of mass of your body the center of gravity falls within this area ok you are stable you are not going to fall over. When it crosses this then you become unstable and so, your muscles so even when you are standing because you are a multi jointed multi segmented uh, structure your muscles are always working that is why even standing tires you see technically if standing did not take any effort then you should be able to stand forever, but standing also tires you because the, there are the slight changes that are being made you know to maintain your balance. So, your muscles are always acting about all these different joints in order to help maintain your balance and that is why. So, you have it, when you are standing this depending on. So, if you see as you get older you may tend to have like a wider stance ok, because you are trying to increase the base of support or you have to hold on to you, you know you add a walker or something. So, that now that base becomes much larger because when you start having balance problems that is when you start going in for assistive devices like that. Even your walking pattern you may change you will see that people walk with a wider stance when they are unsure of that. Whereas, if you look at walking on a tight rope for instance you know highly skilled gymnasts or when they are on that uh, what is it called the pommel horse that uh, bar you know they have. So, they put one foot in front of the other they are balancing on a very narrow base of support in the medial lateral direction. So, they will have uh, so this is your support area and your objective is to maintain make sure your CG falls in that support area to maintain balance. So, the body will remain in balance if the center of mass remains vertically above and within a certain prescribed area on the ground. called as the base of support. Now, standing on your legs is challenging enough ok. You have seen some acrobats do a or gymnasts do a handstand right. See one thing your leg muscles like your uh, um, the gastroc muscles and the soleus muscles are big they can generate enough force to stabilize the ankle joint. If you look at a handstand then essentially your base of support your hands your palms are generally smaller than your feet. 
So, your base of support drastically goes down and you are going to have to apply a huge um, force through your what muscles are these? The wrist flexors. Okay. So, it is a so people who do that generally have very strong wrist flexors. Most of us cannot just do a handstand in one shot, it is it is not something it is it is something that takes a lot of practice uh, and a lot of muscle development in this um, in the wrist area. Okay. Mm -hmm.